This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, and I'm joined by Amy Landau. Amy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Um, can you introduce yourself for us? I'm Amy Landau. I am at the Center for Religion and Cities at Morgan State University, currently serving as the Director of Museum CoLab on the Lifeways of Hope initiative. I've been at working at the Center um, since 2018. I'm also currently the Director of Education and Interpretation at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I was wondering how those relationships worked between the two um, institutions. Love for two cities. Yes. <laughs> I understand that. I'm a Texan, but I live in North Carolina and do work in both. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, the story of your project and the communities that you've been working with? Sure. So for um, the relief and restoration grants um, that were uh, generously funded by the Luce Foundation, we redistributed funds to about a dozen um, grassroots organizations in Baltimore who were doing exceptional work um, during the COVID pandemic in terms of providing housing, providing legal services, providing food in a city that's really been um, under the weight of redlining and food apartheid and other injustices. So it was an honor to work with a rather large cohort to redistribute these grants and to document the great work that these organizations are doing. That's wonderful. Can you um, tell me a little bit about some of your interactions with some of these groups or um, some of the specific stories that stand out in your mind of the work they were doing? Yeah, so my role was to work more with the students at Morgan State because what we wanted to do is we wanted to, one, have an opportunity for both those at the center and the students to learn about the city in which they are embedded. And so, one, it was about documenting the work that these grassroots organizations were doing during the pandemic and to know that they've actually been doing their work far before. Um, and how important it was for all of us to learn about that. And so that was an aspect of knowledge sharing. Two was um, documenting the work through video and audio. So having oral histories and having students and ourselves participate in, in documenting their work. And then I was really involved in the sharing part. And what is it to create a project about sharing these oral histories um, and responses to the work that these grassroots organizations are doing in the public sphere of a museum? Um, so my background has been in museums for the past two decades. And so it was working with students and other members of the center to create an exhibition um, that documented this process and what Baltimore was experiencing during the pandemic. Um, and Baltimore had very specific circumstances given its history. Yeah, I would love to hear more about kind of those specifics and the ways in which you were able to contextualize what was happening um, in, in your community and at the university. Mm -hmm. So the exhibition was called um, Betting on Hope, Baltimore and the Collective, Collective Work of 2020. So first it's um, contextualizing what Baltimore was dealing with given a history of redlining and the, um, the way the city has been defined um, over generations. So it's described by Professor um, Lawrence at Morgan State as the white L and the black butterfly, so very resource-rich institutions, museums, universities are along the white L, and they include, for example, Johns Hopkins University, the Walters Art Museum, Baltimore Museum of Art is just examples, 
and those that are less resourced in, in the black butterfly, which includes Morgan State and Morgan State students in terms of where they're located. So it was like looking at the disparities and the inequalities during COVID um, as mapped out generations before due to redlining and the definition of the city and the defining of the city. That's, um, that's really interesting. I love that it, that you're able to be so, so contextual and specific and kind of highlighting these stories and that, that specific history. Um, can you tell me about a moment um, that you were surprised by the process um, of working on this project, whether it was with interactions with students, interactions with um, mm -hmm. the oral histories, the stories that were told, um, what were some of those moments of, of surprise? It was a very different experience creating an exhibition with such a large collective. So our collective was the student curators who I was working directly with. There was the researchers who were collecting the oral histories. There was the infrastructure folks um, who were paying people to share their stories. And so to create a project with so many people and have that interaction all be via Zoom. Um, and where that could seem depersonalized over an online platform, it actually became um, very personal. And so many of us who joined this project um, benefited in terms of that human connection during the stay at home. And what surprised me is how much I actually um, needed that human connection in creating this project and also learning about the great work that people are doing in that city. Yeah, um, we all needed those kind of moments of connection, I feel like, during the pandemic. And so finding them in any way that we could um, was really important. Mm -hmm. um, so with this being an exhibit, uh, was it a short-term exhibit? Is there a version of it that continues on today? What does that look like? Yeah, so there, it was a physical exhibition. Um, and it also lives online. And what you could experience online is the exhibition texts that the students wrote, the artworks that were in response to the themes of the exhibition and in response to the work that the grassroots organizations, community organizations were doing during that time. So there's like an exceptional artistic production that, that came out of that interaction. And you have audio of the, of the oral histories. And the and the interviews. Um, I'm I'm always a big fan of the combination of, of oral histories and art and all the different types of representation. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. Um, what advice would you have for other scholars or communities who are looking to do this type of work? And I know this was born kind of out of out of a distinct, interesting moment of the the crisis of the pandemic, but for just ways of, of uplifting that community narrative um, and looking uh, more just more contextually right at the at the places we live, what are some what's some advice you would have for other um, scholars, curators, other folks who want to do this kind of work? So speaking from two different perspectives, one is someone um, who's worked in university contexts and also museum contexts. So university contexts the opportunity and the privilege to actually get to know who your neighbors are, where the university is, and to learn about the work that they're doing, and um, to honor that work as, a bo as bodies of knowledge that are equally important to those, to knowledge production in the university. And for a museum perspective, it's how much better th the project is when you're working within a collective because having a singular perspective or singular viewpoint for an exhibition um, just shouldn't be done anymore. I mean, we all know sort of the 
the, the politics of power when it comes to representation in the public space and for one or two individuals to represent histories or like current lived realities um, is not acceptable, not interesting <laughs> in many ways. Um, so it really drove home a point I had been um, thinking about for a while as a curator and this project really solidified that for me. Um, moving towards the end of our conversation here today, um, I want to invite you to think about this conversation as, as a record, as something that will go into the archive for future generations of scholars, institutions who want to do um, community-based work. Uh, for those types of audiences, what would you really want the big takeaway to be about this project? What's the, the one thing you'd want them to really reflect on? That it was the beginning of certain relationships that were initiated and fostered through a moment where we, at, we really needed sort of that human connection and a lot of care and rethinking what it means to work in a university environment or a museum environment, um, working with students that, of course, <laughs> were not past pastors, but the pastoral care is really important. And, um, and to build in the time to create these relationships and think forward in terms of what is going to be the possibility to continue the relationships um, and how are you going to continue those relationships or else the trust that is built at a moment of time is at risk. Um, yeah. That's, um, that's wonderful advice uh, for future generations to really kind of consider the sustainability um, amidst these kind of contexts, so thank you. And also the process, right? And it's building in time for yeah. these projects. Yeah. Um, with that, I think that's all we have time for, so thank you very much. Thank you.